Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special Valentine's Week episode of Ignite Radio Live. That would be St. Valentine, my friends. And you are with Greg and Stephanie Schleter over the five mighty stations of Annunciation Radio for the Almighty. Join us in this great adventure at ilovemyfamily.us. Before we get to our very special program, which is none other than Father Nathan Cromley, we have three brief commercials. First, we want to honor Catholic businesses in this community who are truly committed to professional excellence in building the kingdom. They are All-in-One Payroll, Becoming Gift, Carpets by Auto, Carruth Studio, Cronin Auto Family, Interstate Commercial Glass, Isabel Financial Services, MFC Products, McCartney Coaching, Resourcement, Rob Holer Key Realty, Corey Hawk Medical, Signature Associates, SJS Investment Services, Turning Point Chiropractic, and Westgate Insurance Agency. We encourage you to check out and support these companies who are so committed to building the kingdom here. Find out more at massimpact.us forward slash kingdom. Commercial number two, Belief and Beverage Nights are back the third Thursday of each month. Featuring outstanding clergy in this region. We are so delighted. You can find out more at massimpact.us forward slash BNB. And last but not least, our Lenten Power Hour series for Catholic couples. We're so excited about this. You can find more at massimpact.us forward slash power. And this is going to be held every Wednesday night during Lent for one hour, 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. And it's just going to be awesome. We're so excited about it. Register now. Again, check it out at massimpact.us forward slash power. It Each night will consist of a talk by some amazing Catholic speakers. Like who? Um, Greg and Julie Alexander from the Alexander House. Our beloved Father Nathan Cromley, whom you will hear shortly. Uh, Peter and Debbie Herbeck, Melody Lyons, Father Nick Rowell from Erie, Pennsylvania, just an incredible retreat master, Um, Dr. Bob Schutz, and then we'll have breakout sessions and small groups to do the Live It Gathering Guide and to talk about um, what the gift of what we had just heard and just a real time of Lenten community and going deeper and focusing on that important gift and ministry in marriage. So there are limited spaces available. Register right now. It is filling. In fact, we're delighted. Hundreds have already shared this, and uh, it's going to be an amazing experience. So check it out again at massimpact.us forward slash power. Now, with no further ado, let's get on with our feature presentation tonight, an amazing conference, marriage conference uh, for us, Mass Impact, conducted by Father Nathan Cromer. So I'm going to dive right into my message for you this morning. These three phases, right? He talked about finding them in films and throughout theater. It's actually the three same phases. Even Neil Diamond in his song, right? Kyrie Sanctus Gloria, right? If you can remember that from Jonathan Livingston Seagull, which, believe it or not, I was forced to watch at Toledo St. Francis. I have no idea why they forced us to watch that movie, but... You find these th- three same phases everywhere you go, right? This first phase is the one that, as a priest, I confront the most, and that, as a, as a priest, I find my people understanding the least. And it confronts us when we look at how God leads his people, Israel, and how he leads us. It surprises us. Because if I was asked to lead this retreat, I'd make sure you had comfortable chairs. I'd make sure you had good coffee. I'd make sure that the sound system worked correctly. I'd have a beautiful backdrop up here. I'd make sure that we opened the opening song with a a hymn with a guitar and not just like making something up. I would put us in a beautiful venue. I would do everything that we did here right tonight because the idea is to give you what you need on the outside so that you can flourish on the inside. It's a maternal love, Holy Mother Church. And that maternal love of giving you on the outside what you need so that you can flourish on the inside usually is translated into comfort and care, nurturing, providing, making sure that you have the very best. God is the most perfect mother. So all that is present in motherhood is found in its perfection in God in his provident fatherhood. 
So if I'm going to take care of you like this, I get really surprised when in my life I come across things that are out of my control and that do not seem to be nurturing or caring or wonderful at all. And that could be from an election, which I mean, like, talk about being out of control. You're like, oh my gosh, you know, where is this next one going to take us? So the one wins 2016, everyone's talking about 2018. And then 2018, we're talking about 2020. They're already talking about 2020 now. This is absolutely ridiculous. We just live in a perpetual state of anxiety about this fact that the power does not belong to us. All I can do is vote. And if I live in Toledo, I know which way that vote's going to go. You know, it's kind of like Lucas County, shoot. You know, we should move to a different county. <laughs> Maybe my vote would actually count for something, you know. But at the same time, you see how this goes. And then the same thing with the finances. I mean, you have Pope Benedict announcing the world's financial systems are built on sand. Oh my gosh. You know, like, thank you so much, Holy Father, you know? I mean, and he's right. He's, he, he's right, but like, that does not help my anxiety level at all. And then, to top it all off, especially for married folks like yourselves, then you've got the craziest factor in the whole world, namely your kids. You know? It's like, uh, they're really great, we do everything that we can, we're really great, and they just shoot off like fireworks. They're in all different directions, because they're as free as I am. And since they're as free as I am, how am I supposed to control that freedom? I mean, they're just going to screw everything up. And when they screw everything up, they're going to screw everything and me up, because all I want is a happy family. So, like, this is like, whoa. And I start looking at all those areas of my life, and I'm seeing obstacles from left and right. I mean, the, the bank and my mortgage is an obstacle. Then I lose my job. Now I've got the bank and my job against me. And at the same time, I'm supposed to go to a Christmas party where my successful brother is standing there smiling at me, talking about how his business is going, offering me a job under him, you know, like I'm going to do that, right? Like, <laughs> and we just keep on in this constant struggle. If I were to take a, it, it's funny because like when you take a survey of, of people psychologically and you ask them if the words being spoken inside their head by themselves are positive or negative, 70% of what you say to yourself in your brain is negative. 70%. You could test it. It would be kind of cool. Just throughout the day, ask yourself how many positive thoughts. From this room is too cold, to there's feedback on the microphone, to I can't hear from the microphone, to why are these chairs uncomfortable, to I don't feel like I should even be here. I'm not worthy of being here. I don't know if I'm going to pray. This is going to be charismatic. I'm not charismatic. <laughs> They've already got me singing. I don't know what's going on. We just have this constant stream of negativity happening in our brain. And that constant stream of negativity happening in my brain defeats me in front of the battle that's in front of me because I don't even want to fight the battle anymore when I'm sure I'm not going to win it. And so we find ourselves out of control in so many aspects of our life. Wishing that we could just retire where suddenly it gets easy, right? <laughs> Look at it. it does not get easy when you retire. That's the whole thing. It was funny. You know, I was just speaking to someone recently, and they said, you know, I thought when I retired it was supposed to get easier, and it doesn't. It actually gets harder. Because now the problems are multiplied by three generations. And you still don't. It doesn't matter who you vote for. <laughs> you know? So you're just like, I can't even vote for anybody. So the good news is to look at that and then ask yourself the question that you're going to ask the priest, which you're going to ask me eventually every single person in this world, including myself. I ask myself the same thing. I look at this world out there on the outside and I say, where is God? Because I thought I was going to be provided for. When I went on the retreat, they gave me muffins. You know? <laughs> then I go out into the real world and there's nothing. I don't have any friends. I've got this difficulty, this unforeseen circumstance. I'm constantly engaging in a world that's engaging with me in a way that I'm not comfortable with. And then I look and I say, this is not the way it's supposed to be. And there's a lot of people, a lot of your kids, your teenagers, your young adults, they're not going to church anymore because of that question. They look and they're like, this is not the way it's supposed to be. I don't want a God who's going to lead me through difficulty. I talked with a kid, no kidding, he was about 16 and he told me he was going to sell his soul to the devil. And I tested him because I know a little bit about this. I'm not an expert by any means, but I know enough to like know. And I started asking him questions. This kid was actually going to do it. He had a formula. He had a, a ritual. 
I said, where did you get this? He said, well, I, I go to the satanic websites, and I read the stuff on satanic websites. So try it. Just do a little parental console. <laughs> Don't try it. It's bad news. It's like looking into the, the, that little crystal ball from <laughs> Mordor, you know. This kid was looking into it. He had everything laid out. And I said, why? And he said, the devil loves me more than God. Started peeling into his life, asking him. He had gone to a Catholic school. So this kid, I mean, he, he came to me like, this is me trying to save his soul. I mean, like, he was going to do this. So I just said, why? And he said, because I was in prison last night, and my mom dragged me here to talk to you. And I said, thanks a lot, mom. Thanks a lot. But well, okay, that's what I'm here for, you know. Just. So, and then I said, why were you in prison? He said, because I was beating up my dad. I said, why were you beating up your dad? He said, because my dad was hitting me. And then the story started unraveling. Turned out that the young man had been in a Catholic school. And at Catholic school, he was rejected by, of course, the Christians, <laughs> meaning us. And he was rejected, kind of bullied, made fun of, went into the loser group. Then the loser group in the Catholic school turned on him. So his parents pulled him out of the Catholic school, put him into a public school. This is not in this city, by the way. It never happened in Toledo. <laughs> went to a public school. And in the public school, same exact thing. He gets rejected by the elite. He gets knocked down to lower levels. The lower levels make fun of him. And so he drops out of school. And he goes into a gang. And in the gang, in order to join the gang, you got to win in a fight. You have to get into a fight with the gang members and win. And he lost. <laughs> At this point, I, I almost I tried not to laugh because I'm like, this is like a story. Like, you know, I can't believe this is happening to you, you know. He lost. And when they all ran away because someone called the cops on the kids in the parking lot, he was on the ground and the cops arrested him. They didn't arrest him. I don't know what they did. Took him to the jail, whatever. They called his parents. His dad comes to pick him up, taking him home, and the dad, he said, he was hitting me in the chest like this and saying, you're no good and you're bad and you know, whatever. I can't believe you did this. I'm so ashamed of you. And so the kid hauled off and started hitting his dad as the dad's driving him home from the police station. The dad turns around, drops him back off at the police station. Now, when you hear that story, right, I think you can hear a lot of your own lives. I wanted to be really good. I wanted to go to the right school. I didn't. Then I made a mistake when I was in college. Then after that, I got a job and I tried real hard. The manager messed me over. So because of him, I'm no longer here. Because of them, I'm no longer there. Because of her, I'm no longer here. Because of my kid doing this, then this one gets cancer, then this car accident happens, and then my wife gets speeding tickets continually. I have no idea why. <laughs> but that makes our insurance rates go up, and that's going to jeopardize the entire system of my house of cards. And I have so much anxiety, it's going crazy. And so I'm going to sell my soul to the devil. I mean, I don't sell my soul to the devil like a 16-year-old kid, but I do practically. It means like I don't, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to be going to this mass with this boring homily and this stupid music group. I'm going to pray with God in nature. I'm going to go back out to my little deer stand, and there I'm going to commune with God somehow. And I'm like, man, you went from living off of the bread of life and the bread of angels to like communing with God in your cold deer stand. Like, it's good. He's in the deer stand. I'm really happy. But he's like even more right here in this wonderful, comfortable church. It's called like the Blessed Sacrament. But we don't. And then you're like, well, I'm supposed to go to confession before I go to communion. So I just won't go to both. Like, you know, that's even better. So I'll just play the cool Catholic card. I'll go with my wife to Christmas Mass, Easter Mass. Maybe, you know, it's like, and inside of my heart, I've been frozen because I can't believe that God is treating me this way. It's not conscience. See, it's a journey. Just like that kid, he didn't go to selling his soul to the devil just like that. He went selling his soul to the devil over a journey of three years. Well, your journey's been 50 years, 40 years, 35 years. And you're here today because the Holy Spirit has brought you here to hear the powerful word of God and of renewal. But it cannot start unless I acknowledge in my heart the real enemy isn't on the outside. It's on the inside. The, that's really dramatic. I mean, how cool is that? It can be a movie right now. That's why you have to dig deep. 
reach your hand out. <laughs> it was what? All right. Well, the real struggle isn't on the outside. I want you to get this message because so many of us say if the pressures were let up on the outside, then my life would flourish. This is not the biblical message. God never lets his people stay where they are. He, they are constantly being harassed. Every time things go well for them, they end up falling. So you think, oh gosh, if I had the perfect kids and the perfect house and the perfect hair and the perfect nails, then I'd have a perfect life. It's just like, this is not God's message to you. Why? Because if you did, your outside might be wonderful. And there's nothing wrong with a wonderful outside. We need wonderful outside. But what about the inner man? Would you be hungry? Inside. Hunger on the outside is horrible. But man, hunger on the inside is life. Comfort on the outside is wonderful. But comfort on the inside can suffocate. It's like you have these two worlds and they're measured by two different standards. The outer world standard is not the standard of the inner world. And when we confuse those two, we end up not understanding that our God is interested in the inner man. His first focus in your marriage and giving you each other wasn't so that then you make it through life and live on Golden Pond. Why? Because Golden Pond is going to be evanished in the great con conflagration, which you've never heard about. Hopefully, our wonderful doctors and priests will teach the nine signs of the end of the world. One of them is that everything's going to burn up. <laughs> it's called the great conflagration. It's crazy. I love that word, by the way. It's like, <laughs> now you've heard it. You heard about it from the Catholic priest, from the Pope at the Great Conflagration. It'll all burn up. The mountains will melt like wax. And the sky will be rolled up like a cloak. So then don't build their house where the mudslides are going no, on. <laughs> don't worry about this stuff. you got to worry about it. I know it. But like, man alive, if you could have a heart like God wants to give you, then you would be able to not only weather that storm, you'd be able to transform that storm into grace. Rocky Balboa is one of my all-time favorite folks. I think I've seen all the Rocky movies multiple times, except Rocky V, which deserves to be stricken from the books. I've only seen it once, and it's just like a big mistake. <laughs> kind of like the fourth Indiana Jones movie, you know, a nuclear bomb blast survived in a refrigerator with aliens, like just a bad plot, bad mistake. So we just kind of, that one doesn't count. And he had Jones stopped with the third one. Well, same thing with Rocky. Well, in Rocky Six, there's this scene where Rocky's talking with his, his son and his son is giving him all kinds of grief and he's just like blaming his dad because his dad never loved him or whatever. And Rocky goes into this talk. And he's like, you know, I used to hold you in my hand just like this, you know. And he says the following thing, which I think is really beautiful. He says, life is not about sunshine and roses. It's a nasty and mean place, and it'll beat you to your knees and keep you there if you let it. Don't be telling me that you're not who you want to be because of him or her or nobody. Nobody hits harder than life. It's not about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. It's like this incredible motivational speech. And I think it's so profoundly Christian. You blame it on the priest, you blame it on the bishop. Now you got a good bishop and your priests are halfway decent. Okay, like we've all been through the dark ages. You can't really say that Bishop Thomas is a bad bishop. I and mean, this guy is like, and Bishop Blair, I mean, come on, absolutely amazing. So like we got these amazing bishops, amazing, so keep on going, oh, my church is no good. The Protestant church is so much nice. I was in here, I'm like, I don't know many Protestant churches that are going to be nicer in this place. This is awesome. Look at this room right there by the Blessed Sacrament. I mean, we're doing it here. All right, so what's it going to take for you? It's never going to get easier. Life is never going to be easy. Get it through your brain. The Bible is never there for people saying it's going to be easy. You're supposed to coast. No. And it's because the greatness of a man is not in his comfort. It's in his hunger. 
And God is here to form that hunger, to forge that inner spirit. Whole of Catholicism is focused there. Because if we can transform you on the inside to have this heart of surrender to God, of submission to His holy will, we will have unleashed lions against which no force can stand. That's amazing. Because then the culture isn't telling us what we are. We're telling the culture what it should be. Why? Because it's in here. There's a, a, a story I like very much from the Albania. It's one of the many communist kind of stories. And the, the, the police, uh, some lady had been turned in for being a Catholic. And, uh, you know, this could never happen here. You know, so don't worry about it, right? So <laughs> police guy turned, turned, some lady guy turned in for being a Catholic. And so they came to Ryan Sacker House and they said, we heard you that you have a crucifix, you have your cross. Give us your cross. And she said, I'm not going to give you my cross. So they went through the house and everything. They started getting physical with her and she said, I'm not really going to give you my cross. You'll never take it away from me. And they said, you know, you're going to give us your cross or we're going to punish you. She said, you want to see my cross? Yeah. She goes, you'll never take it away. They go, yeah. She goes, in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> On the inside. Everything God's doing on your outside is to make you that person on the inside. Everything in your marriage, your struggles, your difficulties, and your joys and your blessings, it's there for the inside. Your spouse was given to you for that formation on the inside. They're your journey through life. They're your companion through life. But life is a honing, a forging, and that's why God in his sacraments speaks to our souls. That's why the really the only thing that we have to worry about or the primary thing we have to worry about isn't the outside. It's that inner person in me that cuts me off from God. It's that person in me called pride. And every single one of us will have this person inside of us our entire lives. That's the, the spiritual life is a struggle primarily with ourselves. With sin. With this person inside of me that says, well, since it shouldn't be this way, I'm going to declare that I quit. My reaction to God and to life will be an upraised fist right in his face. I'm not going to church. I'm not praying with my wife. I'm not going to try to talk to my kids about Jesus. I'm not going to read the Bible. Now, what's the going that? You know what I mean? Like, that's what we do inside. I'm mad at God. I'm not going to confession, stupid priest. Oh, yeah. You're blaming it on the priest. Let me tell you, between stupid, there's the one who's able to forgive you and the one who doesn't want to be forgiven. Now, which one's stupid? I mean, you know. <laughs> Just turn on yourself because what happens is that inner man of pride, he hides. He hides behind, here's a couple things, creatures. And you can write these down because afterwards I'm going to ask you to write the biography of your inner man. Number one would be wounds from childhood. You didn't even plan on this, but your dad just was no good. Well, now, if you do his, it's kind of cool when you get older. You start looking back, and you're like, I wonder what his dad was like, you know? Hmm. I bet his dad was St. Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> and then what was his dad like? And what was his dad like? You know, eventually you lose yourself in a story of PTSD from World War I. That got transferred into alcoholism, that raised your grandfather, who himself then went through life, and he was then he went and became a Freemason, or I don't know what, and they did weird things to him, and then he transformed into your dad. And you start to be able to look at life like maybe God looks at it, and you're like, holy cow, that pride that's in me is actually hiding behind a, a straw man. Because, yeah, I've got these wounds, but everybody's got the wounds. I would love to have wounds. The problem is when the wounds have me. Do you have wounds or do your wounds have you? Because if you're fighting in a reaction to what happened when you were 6, 7, 10, 12, 15, they have you. It's great to be able to identify that, you know? It's just wonderful. My dad called me fat when I was 13, you know, it's a, a lot of girls is what happened to them, you know. So therefore I went and got an anorexia. Look at that. So now my anorexia is all because of my dad. 
All right, it's cool. So there's counseling for that, and there's professional help for that, and we've got to do all those things. But I think it's very simple also here tonight. If I can identify that the reason I'm hardened in my heart is because I never felt loved, that just will help me so much to know. Because your spouse knows it. She's just scared to tell you. <laughs> she's just too terrified to tell you, you know, because like every time she says it, <laughs> but she knows it. It would be really cool if you just knew it, just admitted it. We all have it. It's just wounds. You know, uh, I was in high school, and I, I got, I was, <laughs> I, I, this is a true story for me. My, one of my biggest wounds, I was the first kid cut from freshman basketball. Mr. Orozco, God bless him, took me up into his Spanish room. I still remember where I was. I remember the friends that were with me. We all went up together to see who made the team, you know, because, like, it's just perfunctory to see, you know, because, like, none of us were going to get cut. First name on the list, Nate Cromley. And all my friends, of course, they're like, yeah, yeah. And they were just, I remember everyone got real quiet and just kind of shuffled, you know, and then they just kind of like, Phew. and I was just standing there looking at this piece of paper. Like, my whole life had crumbled. I didn't make the basketball team at St. Francis. First name cut, wound. Uh, here I am, 41 years old. I still remember, I was 14. It's a wound. A Roscoe, cut me. It was probably one of the greatest blessings of my life. I mean, Terrific, thanks. He's like, I just saved you 150 hours of your life. <laughs> we have them, right? First one. Second one, failures. You got wounds. Wounds come from not being loved. Failures. That, this is a kind of cool thing because this is a word that in the business world, you're never allowed to say, but in the spiritual, moral, family, marriage world, you repeat over and over and over again. It, it's terrible. You walk into the business world, you're a leader, you're a manager of a, of a thing, you're a, you're a division leader, and you start talking about failure, you're toast, and everyone around you is going to lose their job. You cannot say that word. You do not fail in business. You shift, you pivot. It's the greatest word, pivot. I'm going to actually write a book as soon as I can slow down enough. So if I can get some benefactors behind me, I'll write books all day long. I want to write a book about this because like, it's time we hear this. We walk around with such baggage in our Christian lives, constantly talking about where I'm not, where I'm not, where I'm not. I'm, I'm fine with all of that because you have to acknowledge it. But for heaven's sakes, you're supposed to be optimistic. Meaning if I'm acknowledging it, it's because I'm getting better. <laughs> I'm going to acknowledge my inner man and my wounds and my pride and my stupidity. I'm going to acknowledge all that because of the one who's called me out of it. And he's going to transform that inner person in me by filling me with his grace and sending me forth so that though I be an imperfect instrument, I sing his song. So let's start. You know, that, that's, wow, that's a, that's a recipe for success right there. Because that's exactly what you do in the business world. You don't walk around saying like, you know, what well, guys, like, I, I'm fundamentally flawed. And uh, this whole system and process we got, I mean, we're, 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 I'd, I'd be surprised if we sold anything. <laughs> you're going to walk in there and you're going to be like, this process, we're going to roll, we're going to change, it's fine, let's pivot, boom. And it was like, oh, that's great, great leadership, you know. Right. I'm going to probably do the same thing in your life, in your marriage, right now. We're going to pivot. We're going to pivot by acknowledging that that word failure is not the end. That word failure is an invitation into another way. You see, why would God allow failure into your life? He would allow failure into your life so that you have a deeper fire kindled than the one that brought you there. Thank you. Because that's absolutely true. We should be clapping about that. He, you see how his, his pedagogy is? He's like, you're coming with me into heaven. My goal is to get you ready for that glory. And your life in this world, it's not, it's not there so that you have success in this world because that's all going to melt. Every trophy, every medal, every plaque on the wall, it's all going to melt. Great conflagration. I love it. Just sets everything even. <laughs> but your soul will shine. So I'm here to shine it. And that means if I've allowed you to encounter failure, it's so that you pick it up again and you dig deeper and you've just grown to be a mightier force. This is why in your marriages, he's like, it's indelible and it's forever, and you're not getting out of it. You stay right there and you fight. It's forever. You fight. You fight your way through. Now, there are things that come up. It's 
civil divorce is permitted by the church as a last resort. You know, it's fine. But at the same time, in my heart and in my soul, it's a last resort and it's not my marriage. My marriage is forever. Now, if I have that perspective in it, all right, so my failures, they're opportunities. The worst thing that could happen is that my spouse turned my failure on me into a shackle. So the devil's like, good, I'm going to train them to do that. I'm going to say, good, you failed, boom, spouse, shackle him. Ugh. <laughs> Never let him free. Fifteen years ago, you did this to me. It's like, be silent, witch, back <laughs> into thy cavern. And the reason why, oh witches, you are that way, is because you've been shackled by him. So he'll shackle you, so the only way you can get back is by shackling him. Today we break the bonds free. Christ came for liberation. And that liberation is not just from the outside powers of the devil. It's from the inside powers of sin. And we are the ones who bind, and we are the ones who can lose. Wouldn't it be awesome if today you set your spouse free? How do I do that? You become free yourself. We're going to go into that confessional, and I want you to say every single spot where you have been bound by your husband, bound by your wife, bound by your failures, bound by your wounds, bound by your limitations. The third one over here, you're just born with ADD. I mean, what do you want? You know, <laughs> like I mean, it's kind of crazy. You can't even sit through the talk cry. Right? It's like, mm -mm 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 -mm. Yeah. well, I mean, that's the way you are. You're not going to be any other way. Well, because I, I am that way, uh, that's not a problem for God. Why is it a problem for you? Some of you were born with extremely high anxiety. It's unreal. Sometimes in, in the natural course of, of, of a woman in her cycle, man, there's like three or four days where she's just like a wild she-camel. <laughs> you know? And then she comes back, she's like, man, I just don't know what happened. And you're like, I think I know what happened. <laughs> It's going to happen again about 28 days from now. You know, it's like, I don't get this. I say that because, you know, I, this, this is exactly what happens. In the life of a priest, I, there are some people, they'll call me just on a regular kind of interval. And it's with this anxiety that's just like through the roof. And you can't really say anything because you're a priest, you know, but you're just going like, oh, my gosh. And then about three days later, she calls back. You know, I don't know what happened. Boy, I'm just so much better. It must have been your prayers. Like, yeah, that's right. Very powerful prayers. <laughs> That's how you are, right? So if I put those things around, I can end up with all kinds of excuses that really, the real problem isn't those excuses. Those are just prickly defense systems of justification. Because the real problem, it's not that I have problems. It's that my problems have me. And that's a choice that I make to define myself by my defeat. And that choice we're going to change today. Here and now. If I can at the very center transform that attitude into a surrender to Jesus Christ and His mercy for me, then I can face my wounds with confidence, my failures with fight, and my limitations with a smile. But if I don't change that fundamental choice that I have and empty myself, I'll be a prisoner to those very th same things. I'll justify my own imprisonment without recognizing that there's a choice inside that I made to die. I'm here on behalf of your Savior to reach out that hand of God into your souls and say, rise. How do you do that? I humbly recognize before Almighty God that He is God and I am not. <laughs> I like to laugh about that because it's like so simple, right? But what you see in the lay of the land, it suddenly becomes extremely powerful. 
if I could go into this church today and kneel down in front of him and actually say, you are my God. And I believe you love me. Everything would change from the inside. Profoundly, this is why God treats us the way that he does. This is why God leads us the way that he does. This is why life is not easy. It's because deep down inside, God's looking for that one thing. If I can have that one thing, and if I can make that one fundamental change, when I come back open to my eyes, and I look at my wife with the love of my father behind me, and the overwhelming power of his grace sustaining me, and the knowledge of his saving love inside of me, well, I'm going to try to save her. I'm going to try to reach out to her. I'm going to try to unshackle her, unbind her, lift her up. And if she could do the same with me, I mean, the gates of hell would not prevail against the church that was just formed called my marriage. And then we really wouldn't care who got elected. No one gets elected, that's more souls I get to save. I guess more people now get to know from their own misery of our own culture going down the tubes, they're going to get to know that moment that I just went through. See how that works? Now, don't identify this moment with experience. You might not feel anything. You might not cry. It might even be a blessing. People sometimes, it's, it's actually never been a man. It's always been a woman. But about 55 women have come to me, Father, what, what's it like when you say mass? You know? And they just wait. You know, you're supposed to say like, oh, there's this fire. It's hard. There's an encounter, a divine embrace, I'm lost in his eyes. I mean, like, because the response is really underwhelming. I'm like, I don't, I don't feel anything. I go to Mass too. So when I'm at Mass, what am I feeling? Nothing. Why? That's the greatest grace. That way I don't muddy the waters at all of my gaze, which is on him. Truth will set you free. Don't worry about the feelings. The feelings come, great. Letting go of your life usually unleashes a lot of good things. Fine. I want truth. Your marriage won't change until you do. Your family won't change until you do. Your life won't change until you do. But when you do, you start changing your world. What is that? That inner change is to stop justifying it by your wounds, your limitations, your failures. Stop it. And by instead going right in front of your God and humbly opening yourself to the fact that He is your Savior. And therefore I shall sing His name. I'm going to let it go. So we have confessions coming up. I want you to go. And especially now, if you went last week, maybe hold off till the line is down. I'll be darned. You get there in the confessional of the priest, and the first 10 people are like, I went yesterday, but you're such a holy priest, I wanted to go again. <laughs> Let's let the big fish come. <laughs> you're what we call a minnow. Throwing you back inside. Good job. All right, let me spend 15 minutes with you. Meanwhile, your husband hasn't gone in 25 years. Well, maybe it's time that you kind of say, hey, why don't you go this time? Go to confession and make it clean and simple. You don't have to go into a sob story. If you can, some people, that's what you do. But you don't have to. You could just go in there and say, I'm super ashamed because I stole. And I've never told anybody. And I've hidden this fact that I've never told anybody. Let God come back in. You just heard Father Nathan Cromley's very powerful first session at our Marriage Mission Retreat. And uh, now we're going to go on to his talk number two, which actually took place in the context of the homily during the Mass. The uh, truth about the Catholic faith astounds me. I remember when I was ordained a deacon. I was, it was at Ars in France. That's the same place where the famous Curie of Ars lived. And I got to pray there in front of his body, 
before going down into the crypt church there for an ordination. And it was the first time in my life that I was able to be on the other side of the altar looking out. Uh, and it just completely blew my mind. They had chosen me to be the uh, deacon of the Mass, so deacon of the Eucharist. So I was the one standing next to the cardinal, you know, my, right after ordination. I just got ordained, and they just go right around the side and start serving. And uh, they chose me because they said, you know, you, you won't crack. You're good in front of people, you know. So, but I was tempted to crack, not because of the people, but because of the Lord. I was standing on this side of the altar, and, and the altar was filled with golden saboria. Saborium, saboria. Saboria. And they were all lined up there. There was 28 of them, filled to the brim with the host. And I remember being there, my hands folded and looking up, and a vast sea of people, 3,000 people in this crib church, huge, just filled with people looking. And there on the altar, glimmering in gold, the bread of life, and the only thing missing was someone to take the bread of life to the people. And then I realized that was my job. That henceforth, I was to bring grace to men and men to God. That, that was something else. <laughs> I don't think we talk enough about how overwhelming it is. I wish more of you could have the experience that the priest has. Number one, you'd be more merciful during homilies. <laughs> and number two, you would understand so much of God's love for you. Because when you're on the side, the masculine side of the fence, the side of the God coming at you, and your job is to sow the seed of the Word into the soil that's to receive it. And when your job is to be the Father who feeds the family, you're, you're overwhelmingly humbled at the immensity of the grace that God has to give us. St. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, is also overwhelmed. He says, every grace and blessing that there is in heaven, every grace and blessing that there is in heaven has been given to us in Christ. That means that there's not a single thing that God could have given that he didn't give. And that means that if that Jesus is here, <laughs> which we in the Catholic Church profess boldly, that means that every single grace and blessing in existence, the fullness of God himself, is 35 feet from you. And in a matter of moments, will be in my hands. As I lift up the sacred host, and I'm enveloped in the Trinity, Circumin in, in, circumincession is what they call it in theology. I just call it awesome. As my frail humanity follows the Lamb upward in His ascending motion into the Father's bosom, wrapped in the Holy Spirit, and then I'm sent back to you to place that trinity on your tongue. God's blessing is without limit. Do not limit it. <laughs> God's blessing is without repentance. Do not give him your reasons why not. Let him in this mass give you his reasons why. I can look up at the cross of my Lord and I can give him 35 reasons why he should not have done that for me. I can give him 365 reasons for every day of my life. It does not matter. I do not do this because of your perfection, he says, but because of your imperfection. Give me your imperfect soul and let me perfect it. Give me your sin that I might give thee grace. Isn't that amazing? I give him darkness, he gives me light. I give him sorrow, he gives me joy. I give him wounds by scourging his back. And he gives me forgiveness.
by setting me free and shedding his blood. He is not outdone by anything in, you have done. Man, I sound like a poet. This, part, <laughs> this is really good. I should write this down. <laughs> I don't have it written down, but it's just coming. Because it's beautiful. It's beautiful being a priest. That's why I say I wish you could just come up here and have to preach to yourselves. Because if you did, you'd find the hope that I have in my heart for you. It's a hope that's rooted on a God who does not change. Paul, letter to, the, letter to the Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what is that Jesus Christ? Paul, 2 Corinthians. He is a yes and never a no. Isn't that crazy? We are yes and no. Jesus is only yes. Man, alive. No wonder in 2 Corinthians 2, 2 Corinthians 1, he says, this is why Jesus leads us forward in a victorious procession. A victorious procession. He wants us to be clothed in white robes, palms in our hands, singing his name. And it's not, there's absolutely nothing in this earth that is stronger than his love. The only thing that can keep us back, the only thing, is us refusing his mercy. I will not force you to love me because then it would not be love. I will not force you to accept me because then it would not be acceptance. I will not violate you, but I will knock vehemently. And we hear his knock. Every new son of daughter that's born and you held and you hold in your arms is God knocking at your door? Where do you think this came from? <laughs> and every birthday party celebration and candles being blown out and you realizing that this little plant is growing into a beautiful tree is God knocking at the door. And every funeral of your parents and of your uncles and of your aunts and every wedding day of your best friend's children and every success and every failure is Jesus behind you saying, open to me, let me come. My word is your life. My life is your light. My light is your eternal reward. Follow me. Let go of the things of darkness and of the things of the past. Stop telling me why I should not love you and let me for a few moments simply smile upon you. Song of Songs 8 my sister, my dove, my only one, rise and come. For my dew is wet with the dews of the night. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Hark, my heart, it is my lover who knocks. It's like unreal. The dialogue between Our Lady's eyes and the eyes of Jesus on the cross. It must have been immense. What did he say without saying anything? The amount of love that he had for Peter, for James, for John, and for Judas. The amount of love that he had for this broken world pent up behind those eyes. And she saw them. St. John, when he talks about Jesus, speaks of his eyes twice. And both times he said his eyes were like flames of fire. His eyes were like flames of fire. The God I'm talking about, the Jesus who's coming into your life by the Blessed Sacrament and by the power of confession is a God of fiery love for you. When St. Therese realized this, she said, Même si j'ai commis tous les crimes possibles, je ne douterai jamais de sa miséricorde. Parce que mes péchés les plus durs sont rien qu'un goutte d'eau dans une fournaise brûlante. Even if I committed every possible crime, I would have the same trust. For even my darkest sins are like a drop of water thrown into a blazing furnace. That's cool. I know St. Therese saying that, too. You know what I mean? Like, wow. 
St. Therese could say that, and she didn't do anything. She died when she was 24. You know, she was a nun at 15. Imagine what you could say. My darkest sins, my darkest, whatever it is, darn it all, let God love you. He's a father who's at the door knocking. How long are you going to make him knock? Stay, get rid of your shame, get rid of your doubt, get rid of me, you know what I mean? Like, just get over it. It's like that great motto one of my friends told me in college. They said, if you could write a book, what would it be? It was like an icebreaker. And she said, I think the title of my book would be Build a Bridge and Get Over It. Which I liked very much. I never forgot that. Build a bridge and get over it. You're like, ah, oh, but I'm just a wretched. Yeah, you are a wretched. Yeah, I don't feel like anybody loves me. Yeah, you, fine. Like, let's stop talking about you for three seconds, okay? You know, yes, you are a beaten up, just lousy person because everyone drilled it in your head. Fine. That was the first talk. I want to now talk about my God. Because when he had everything in the heavens, Jesus Christ did not deem his equality with God a thing to be clutched. No, rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being put to death in the cruelest form and the lowest form possible. Your deaths will be nobler than his. It would be like Jesus being put to death in an electric chair in front of everybody after having been condemned by judge with irrefutable evidence. You know what I mean? I mean, like, you're like, just let that scumbag die. Let him die. Let him fry. Right? That would have been Jesus' death. You at least will die in your bed, surrounded by your family, people holding your hands, nurses saying, just let go, embrace the light. You know, you're going to have all kinds of great things around you. And you got Jesus dying on a cross in front of his mother, his mother bearing his shame, everyone having fled Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Why did he do that? Out of pure love for you. That's why he did that. Because he loves you. And he wants you to be with him for all eternity. He knew that Simon Peter would sin before Simon Peter sinned, and he still ordained him a Catholic priest. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? The night of Peter's ordination, he'd commit the sin of apostasy three times in the presence of Jesus himself. Even the later martyrs is a little bit of a lesser sin, because they're like, 200 years ago, there was Jesus, I believe, not anymore. Ah, oh, apostasy, mortal sin. Peter's right there. The night of his ordination, he's ordained a priest. I mean, it's like, Maximentale in terms of sins. This guy is like, that's like, I mean, like, and then you're like, well, I, I lusted after women. That's nothing compared to apostatizing in the presence of the Savior three times in a row the night of your ordination. To the pontificate. I said, I just thought of this. It wasn't even to the priesthood. He was, he was consecrated, he was ordained a priest, consecrated bishop, and elected pope on the same night. And he turned around and denied that guy who'd done everything for him. And Jesus looked at Peter. Luke, Gospel of Luke. Then Jesus turning saw Peter. And Peter wept. The thing I love about Peter is that after finished weeping, you know where he went? This is a little, a little fact. I've never heard this. I've only heard one priest ever to say this, which is why I'm repeating it to you. It's so cool. Where did Peter go? In the, in, the, in the Gospel of St. John, it says, Mary Magdalene then went to find Peter. And finding Peter with John, she then blah, 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 told them, and then they ran. Wait a second, where was John? John 19, 28. From that hour, he took her into his home. He underscores, from that hour. That means that Peter went back to the Virgin Mary. Did he go to apologize to her? I would rather say yes. Who knows? In heaven we'll find out. But it's delightful to consider that fact. And if he never didn't go to apologize to her, he definitely apologized when he saw her. And I bet, and this is just me, but knowing the Virgin Mary like I do, when he saw her eyes, he was given new life. 
Because the eyes of Mary give life. She saw the eyes of fire on the cross full of love for Peter. And like the moon, she reflected that light of mercy into his soul. And Peter knew Jesus loved him because he saw her. And her witness to hope is at the heart of every priest in every parish. This is what kindles the fire of the Catholic Church. It's the knowledge of the love of Jesus Christ for your soul. And that love comes through Mother Church, Mother Mary, and that means through you. It's not just the priest that's all fired up. It's you. To be those eyes of fire for your spouse. Not your fire alone. But your fire having been caught fire by Jesus' fire. But to be those eyes of love for your children. Those eyes of mercy. God loves you this much. Every time you stretch open your arms and give them a hug, you can think of that. Because that's what we should be thinking about. So immense and so in, uh, unforgettable is the power of that love that we put it at every crucifix in every Catholic church. There he is. This much. There's such an incredible power in this proclamation. And, and it's something that we just have not heard enough. I don't know why except maybe we just are want to be bored because we don't want to be disturbed by this immense truth that built these walls and handcrafted this altar and put a cloth on it and candles in front of it and forced a man to take three vows unto death to stand behind it. The greatness of this truth. You were made for God. And God has come to find you. And he's in front of you now.